<clears throat> one morning, Jesus sat in the court of women and watched people as they put their offering in the treasury. These, these treasury offering places were just big brass urns that had kind of trumpet-shaped uh, openings at the top. And whatever you brought, you just kind of poured into the top of these, these urns through those, through those trumpets. And lots of wealthy people came by with their sacks of treasure. And whether they meant to or not, they probably drew notice as they, they struggled to raise their sacks of money up to the, to the top of those uh, urns and pour that money in. And everybody standing nearby could hear the money as it poured into these great brass urns, the jingling and the tinkling of the coins. And one poor widow, uh, no doubt picking her way through the crowd, sort of making an indirect way towards those treasury urns, I think probably pushed and shoved by people who had more important business than she could possibly ever have. But, but she didn't want to be noticed. She, she, she was almost sneaking her way to the treasury, and she finally stood before one of the urns, pulled her hand out of her tattered shawl, where she had been hiding two small, tiny coins. Mites, they were called, lepta in Greek. Uh, they were hardly worth anything, one 128th of a day's pay for a poorly paid agricultural worker, probably just worth a few cents. And looking from one side to the other, sort of embarrassed if somebody saw her, she quickly threw in the two coins, and as quickly as she could, she walked away. And Jesus jumped up and grabbed the sleeves of his disciples and said, Look, 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 look! I tell you, truly, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And Jesus never really specifically says what it was about the widow's gift that caught his eye, whether it was her faith. I mean, after all, she put in all she had to live on. And I'm wondering, where's she going to buy bread today? What's she going to be eating today if she put everything she had in that particular gift? Well, maybe she would say, if you ask her, I'm pretty sure God's going to take care of me. I don't know, maybe it was her willingness to sacrifice. This was all she had. And her regard was, for God was so huge, it was so overwhelming, that, that out of her gratitude for him, she gave him everything. I, I really think the thing that caught the eye of Jesus was her generosity. A, a, a clean-spirited goodwill that characterized everything about her. Here she is, destitute, desperately poor. Two mites is all she has to live on, just a few cents. She is a widow left behind by her husband. She has no other protectors or providers. It would have been really easy for her to be closed off and to be angry and bitter and cold and just away from everything, squeezing those mites with all her might, squeezing until the, the eagle screamed, just, just, I've just got to hang on to this tiny bit that I have left. After all, it's all that I have left. But she isn't that way at all. I, I sort of see this woman shrouded in light, smile on her face, an open sort of friendliness about her, and even if she might go to the treasury and, and give her gift and hoping to be unnoticed there there's still an open heart in her I, and I'm sure I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is probably not the only time she gave everything I when Mrs. Smith's daughter next door fell ill with the fever I bet it was this poor widow who came up with a bowl full of soup oh no 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 she said please it's it's only left over from lunch but she went without eating that day or when she passed a beggar on the street, I bet if she had anything, anything at all, she dropped it in his cup with, with a smile and with a hug. There, there was always someone worse off than she was, someone who needed what she had worse than she did. I, I see her maybe so enclosed for all the old ladies up and down the street, patching their clothes and keeping them going, or maybe even rummaging through the trash bins, and everybody thinks she's just an old bag lady looking for something to eat, but she always finds some pr treasure that she is sure that someone in the neighborhood would be thrilled to have. And it was this generous spirit that caught Jesus' eye, a, a, a willingness to think of others, even in the middle of your own troubles and trials. It's a heart of love that's not consumed by her own poverty, but a tender heart with eyes that see the needs of other people and is moved and touched to do whatever she can do 
And even though she is poor, she is involved. She's engaged. She's looking for ways to be generous and to share what she has. And you almost say that in a mocking way. What she has? She, she has nothing. Two tiny mites, hardly worth talking about, especially in comparison to, to all of the great gifts that the wealthier people were pouring into the urn. No one would have missed the tiny amount that she was able to give. And yet Jesus says this is worth more than everything given by the wealthier contributors. That sort of puts a, a different spin on the tiny bit you and I are able to contribute, doesn't it? I mean, when we think of our own efforts, we, we think of them as so tiny and so, so weak that they, they won't make any difference. And we just shrug our shoulders and say, well, why try? I mean, it isn't going to make any difference. It isn't going to matter. And we walk away. And maybe that tiny thing that we are able to contribute, whether money or time or effort or skill or caring or involvement, Maybe that's going to make all the difference. Jesus said she put in everything she had. Panta Hosa Aiken. I've heard that somewhere else. That, that phrase, kind of that similar phrase I've heard someone else. I, I see Jesus eating at the home of Simon the leper. And a woman came in with this alabaster jug, a very expensive perfume, and she smacked the jug on the side of the table and poured the perfume on the head of Jesus. And the disciples were indignant. Wait, wait, this could have been sold for more than a year's wages. No, no telling how many poor people we could have fed with, with all the money that this, this alabaster jar would have brought. And Jesus said sharply, leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Then he said... The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. She did what she could. She did what she could. Hoeskin, Aiken, Apison. What she had, she did, he said. What she had, she did. Now, there's an implied in critique of the disciples here. They seem to have this idea that you need a lot of money to help the poor. If you're really going to make a difference... Man, here's our opportunity. This huge alabaster jar worth more than a year's wages. We can really make a dent in poverty with that. And Jesus confronts their lack of generosity. I, I sort of hear Jesus saying, you sure are free with other people's stuff. What are you doing for the poor right now out of your own resources? Uh, this woman, what she had, she did. And that's the same sort of idea that Jesus has pointed out with the widow at the treasury. What she had, she gave. It's that same sort of uncalculating generosity that considers others and doesn't work, worry about itself. Here's Jesus, and I love him, and I have some expensive perfume. I'll anoint him with it. I'll pour it on his head. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be also told in memory of her. She did what she could, Jesus said. Actually, he said she did what she had. The, the opportunity presented itself, and out of her generous spirit, her love for Jesus, she wasted all of this perfume on him. Paul wants the Corinthians to cultivate this same sort of generosity. He begins talking to them in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there... The gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, 
Your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Gold is a quality. As it's written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Paul says you have everything. You have faith. You have speech. You have knowledge. You have zeal. You have love. That word excel there in in that verse in verse 7 is actually, the NIV translates it excel, but actually it's overflow. You, you have these running over. You have more than you can imagine. Your blessings are just running out onto the floor and out into the street. Everything that is important, he says, you already have. Now, make sure that all of that is handled out of a spirit of generosity, that, that open way of looking at people that is looking to do good for, pe- for, for them. And don't hoard your blessings, Paul says. Share them. You know, I, I think we all have this tendency to poor mouth ourselves. <laughs> Shucks, I don't have anything to offer. I'm not rich. Now, Bill Gates, Bill Gates is rich. He's got a lot to share, and he's, he can really make a difference with what he can give. He can build a school, or he can drill a water well, or, or he can feed a neighborhood for a good while. Me? Uh, what can I do? I, I'm not smart. I'm not good at anything. I'm just a poor guy trying to do the best I can, and I don't have a whole lot to offer. And we make excuses convincing ourselves that we can't make a difference because what we can contribute is just so small. And Paul said, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. According to what you have, not according to what you don't have. And you hear those echoes, don't you? What she had, she did. What she had, she gave. It isn't the size of the gift that you're able to give. It's the willingness to make the effort that makes all the difference. I I can't imagine that the Macedonians were able to give much to the poor in Jerusalem. In in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2, Paul says, In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Now Paul makes it sound like they're just giving huge amounts. You can't imagine what the Macedonians gave. I mean, I, I, there's just this incredible amount of money that I'm going to be hauling back to Jerusalem. In the middle of a very severe trial, in the middle of extreme poverty, Paul says they gave as much as they were able, and they gave more, but I bet it wasn't much. What counted with Paul and what made their contribution so huge was not the absolute value of it, but it was their generous spirit that came from their faith and love and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. And with Paul saying to these Macedonians, no, 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 you, you guys don't have anything to give. God doesn't want you to go hungry too. Someone else will help the poor in Jerusalem. But don't worry about it, you guys. Poverty, trial, bad things happening all over the place. Don't worry about giving anything. And the Macedonians were insistent. We can give something. We, we, we have to give something, Paul. Don't you see? They need us. And Paul shook his head and took the few dollars that they'd scraped together. And no doubt he wept when he saw their generosity. I I think Paul suspects that the Corinthians can give a lot more than they think they can. They have poor mouthed themselves into thinking that they don't have anything. And they think that they can't give because they don't have anything to give or that even if they gave it would be so small that it really wouldn't make a difference. But Paul knows that their souls have sort of shriveled up and they have gone into protect mode. They're worried about what they have rather than being concerned about the needs of people and they're hoarding what they have because they're afraid it might run out and they think that they can bless someone only when they have a whole lot to give so instead of becoming generous and being generous they have become miserly and they they even think of Jesus that way I think 
that Jesus only gives out of his riches. Christ gives out of his wealth. He shares with us out of all those wonderful things he has because he is God. After all, he is God and he owns everything. And when he gives us, well, you know, sometimes he just dribbles it out to us in little droplets, I guess. But still, it comes out of his rich storehouse of everything that he owns. And Paul snorts, are you kidding? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus laid aside all of the privilege of being God so that he could come where you were and live like you live and do the same sort of things you do and experience the same sort of things that you experience. He, he lived in the same poverty that you experience so that he can show you how God would live your life. And on top of that, in order to free you from sin's power so that you can live this rich new life, he died. And he didn't die quickly and easily, but he was tortured to death and he became powerless and he became poor so that he could buy you back from Satan's slavery. You know how much it cost him, Paul asks? You cost him everything. And it wasn't out of Christ's wealth that he blessed you. It was out of his poverty. And you want to think that because you're poor, you can't be generous? Generosity, he says, is not measured by dollars. It's measured by love. It isn't how much you're able to give, but how much you love that matters. I want to prove the sincerity of your love, he says. And love is about little things as much as it is about big things. It's, about, it's not just about dollars and cents. It's about faith and love and sincerity and zeal and earnestness and all of those things that Paul talked about with the Galatians. Lauren Isley wrote about walking along the beach. He said, I noticed as I walked along the beach, there were thousands of starfish that were left high and dry by the tide. Starfish who were going to die because they couldn't get back to the water. And he came around a point and came upon a man who was picking up starfish and tossing them back into the water. And Isley commented as he looked up and down the beach. He said, what, what difference can you make? Because there are so many starfish that are going to die. And the man stood there with a the star finish in his hand and looked at it for a moment. And he said, it makes a difference to this one. And he tossed it back into the ocean. For if the willingness is there, Paul said, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Everything she had, she gave. What she had she did. Christ Jesus gave everything so that you might have a healthy, saving relationship with the Father. And I invite you to respond to his love today as we stand and sing. Would you please come?